Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Warner. Well, I'm looking forward to this conversation and thanks everyone for turning out. I've been writing for, for years. Uh, you know, I, I run Entrepreneur Seminar for many years and that's about 80,000 words. But I've never written a, a paperback or a hardcover. I look for accelerating opportunities for entrepreneurship and I have the best story that was always in me. And my co-founder, every day he'd say to me, or almost every day, not, not every day, but this is a book, we should, we should write this. And I said, well, I wonder who will get to it first. And this is just one of those compressed stories, 17 months, cradle to grave, or idea to exit, the early signs, as it's a story that people want to read. And that I chose a part of my life that was worth writing about, because uh, I can't say all of my life is worth writing about. But if you are looking for a tour de force of entrepreneurship, where many things go wrong, as well as some go right, then this is a story that every entrepreneur should read, not a bio of any just entrepreneur. Uh, it's not a how-to guide. It has a lot of context, has narrative, as you know, and plenty of insights at different levels of entrepreneurship. Uh, I quote here, <clears throat> the 3D printer was going to be as indispensable an accessory as a phone or a laptop. Everything will be DIY. Print your own house, print your clothes, your shoes, your bed, and your bath. How did you come to get drawn into it? Weren't you, weren't you mainly in finance before that? I, I started out as an entrepreneur, you know, as a kid, and I went through a whole bunch of, you know, different things, including renting computer games or Atari games and ticket touting and all kinds of things. I was always trading something. The other side of me was that I was a builder. I liked to create things and just, you know, throw them out there and see if they worked. But I guess my... My career didn't take that path. I, I took the path from an entrepreneur to an entrepreneur. So I started building things and became a bit of a maverick inside some large organizations, some banking, management consulting. And I think ultimately um, I got asked to leave because the single-mindedness of what I thought was right and ultimately got called back to, to keep that product in the organization <coughs> meant that I was much more suited to entrepreneurship. And at that time I became obsessed with the subject and I felt that, that there were a, a lot of things missing in the tool set for entrepreneurs. And so it was only a matter of time that I was going to get there. And that was about you know, 20 years ago, where I was becoming almost immediately an outright entrepreneur. Um, I was in finance for, for nine years. Um, but I think the question is, is how did I you know, come to uh, you know, really be in 3D printing? And... I'm a meanderer by, you know, by nature. I'm curious about a lot of things. Uh, I like just about any technology that makes sense. Anything that I can you know, understand, feel like there's meaning behind it or a purpose. Um, I have to be deeply passionate. Um, it sounds like a, such a cliche that we should do things that we love. Um, but I can give you countless examples of when passion is missing, failure is looming or imminent. And so... When you're in the really, really low lights, which we might get to, of entrepreneurship, um, you, know, you have to really want to do something. But it came about by curiosity, by discovering someone very close to me was also involved in it. And you know, a few cigars, a bit of champagne and a hot tub later, we'd just um, come up with a company and a product and thought we'd go and build the hardware. And, and the rest is history. And we went and did it. You know. Can we still say that this is a story that is re relevant to all entrepreneurs? Well, yeah. I mean, so, so let me put it to you this way. Forget your traditional idea of what an entrepreneur is, and I'll just give you three views of how people enter entrepreneurship. One is they'll do a job that's uh, a, a, a compatible level of risk, and they'll have some knowledge of it, or they'll be inspired by something someone else has seen, and these are mum and pop shops, they're restaurants, they're things that are very understandable because they're in our culture. And you can be really successful doing that. You can franchise that, learn, learn the hell out of it. The great example I've got is a friend that had a car wash, learned everything about a car wash, learned about the autonomics and engineering of a car wash, bought more car washes, became very, very successful. So the idea of taking a simplistic idea that's in the mainstream and improving it, or finding an area or a region that you can go and 
accelerate into with your own brand is, is wonderful. That's a slower rate of entrepreneurship, but has just as much opportunity. The other one is that you could just, you know, go and join a startup, uh, be an entrepreneur by being around entrepreneurs. And, you know, if that startup does real, gets its founding, uh, uh, funding, I should say, monetizes well, manages its risk, then maybe there's some deferred stock options you can do very well there. People have done, done very well. Um, the third one is a volcano on the island, right, where you know, it, there's a risk reward and you may go and live on this, this island and try to mine it as fast as you can before being, you know, burnt alive. And those kind of opportunities have a certain level of, of, of acceptance that an entrepreneur needs to know up front. And you can move fast. Everything you do is about survival. And so you have to look for ways to trick entrepreneurship. So how you, you know, how you break your story to market. Lots of tricks in, in the way that you do that. Um, you know, another great example uh, is that people make their plan and they say to themselves, this is what I can get done. But that's irrelevant if you're on the volcano island. It's what should be done. And then worry about the resources later. That's what venture capital is for. So you, you have to completely rethink the, the pace in which you want to operate. Those are the three types of entrepreneur. Now, put all that aside, if someone just wants a great business story, a you know, gripping thriller, well, you know, a number of things busted. You know, they broke and we had to fix them. And, and not, not, not least of all, at least 200 printers going around the world that just crashed you know, before we entered a conference and had to rebuild them. You know, we had people after our trade secrets and everything. It's just a, a very cool story because it's so compressed. Um, so I think if you love business stories, it's great. If you're an aspiring, budding entrepreneur, it's a must read. It's written for people at that level. If it's for existing entrepreneurs who want to be reminded of, of accelerated entrepreneurship, they're going to get a lot from it. There's an operating philosophy behind it, which I tried to keep to, but it was sometimes impossible to do um, just because I didn't intend to throw the rule book out the window, but things were moving so fast that, that, that it happened. But I think that when you read the book again, and as I wrote it, I read it a few times, I'm looking at it and thinking to myself, you can stare into this and re-examine what you're doing several times. So it's for all entrepreneurs and people that just love a good business story. Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm not getting away by saying that you manage to combine the <clears throat> sort of weaving together, really, that, that narrative. It's very dramatic, dramatic and full of highs and lows. Uh, with this kind of subtle professorial how-to guide. Is that always the plan, or is that like two books, two books in one, or do you think of doing one or the other? I think it's a lot easier to do one. Yeah. Right, it's much easier to write a novel um, or go and write a how-to guide. The argument is that they can become very dry when you're just reading a technical manual. But if you can provide um, a background uh, and the foreground is entrepreneurship, right? the character is an entrepreneur going through the book, it's so story-led, I think it's the film in me, yeah. that thinks if I could get away with uh, unloading a lot of insights in a natural chronology with a start, a, a good chunky middle and an end, and get away with a general release book, well, hopefully, A, it's more, more readable, and it will reach more people, and they'll have more, more, more effect. And I think that so far, and it's early, um, you know, that, that's, that's what it's intended to do, and it's been picked up that way. Well, reading the book, I know you were working like a maniac on this full color Prudes 3D printer for something like 17 months. Was there a high point you particularly recall? Every time we fixed a problem, it, it was like a natural drug. It was like endorphins, you know, we, we, we thought, because we were staring failure. Um, other than when we got the offer, and I don't want to fast forward to the end, but obviously someone had validated and valued our business and said, you know, we really like this. The problem was the offer was, I don't want to swear, it was three times more <laughs> than we actually got. And then we got negotiated down because of the um, inevitable slowdown uh, I wouldn't say a, uh, a bursting of a bubble, uh, but the hype cycle was slowing down. And so you know, we were high for a moment and then low. And this was the nature of, of this kind of accelerated form of entrepreneurship. And, and it, it's exhilarating. It's also immensely stressful. 
Uh, there were lots of highs when we uh, showed our first video on, on, on the internet and we broke it on Twitter. It was amazing. It was like magic. We had this weird track. I don't know what this soundtrack was to this 3D printer. We were printing a vase. And it just looked so beautiful, this object being printed out of nothing. And then as soon as we released it, someone said online that that's impossible. It's CGI. I thought, well, I'm in film, but I'm not going to spend 10 million on 400,000 frames just to you know, make up a video. Mm. And, and so we, like, we felt, oh, my God, that's really tough. And then the following day, I woke up to 29 counts of defamation in an article about me, accusing me of lying that the video wasn't real. And I thought, wow, that's tough. And so we were out there and, you know, we, we got these offers. Like we'd wake up and we were on the front cover of a magazine and we hadn't done an interview. So, of course, we went, oh, this is amazing, hoping that the article wasn't panning the product or something, right? But there are other things that were just terrible. So we got a call up from Fox News and they said, listen, we're covering 3D printing. We think it's going to be the next big thing. Um, can you come on? So we come on and, and we're like, what's the first thing we're going to show them? We'll show them a robot and show that we printed this. It's got an Android um, you know, chipset in the head and it moves and everything. And I said to my co-founder, I said, whatever you do, do not let that thing go because it will look like it's drunk. <laughs> right? And it will fall down and it will prove that it's pretty much got no utility whatsoever except it's made of plastic. And so as we do it, we're, he's holding it in his hand. This thing is trying to hold it still live on the news desk. And Stuart Varney said, I dare you to let it run across the, 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 <laughs> the desk. So... You know, I'm the media guy. So I said, I said, Mike, I said, I said, you could. I said, but you know, if it crashes, it's going to be terrible. And we decided to address the, the, the risk head on and just be honest about it. Next time we get the call up, he said, you know, we really love this. We'd like you to print live on TV. <laughs> We're like, well, live on TV with a prototype, you know, inventing full color 3D printing just for some very quick context. Um, we were a plastics based printer or polylactic acid. This is a thermoplastic, so we have to drag five colors, CMYK and white, think of an inkjet printer, this plastic with motors up it, into a heated chamber at 220 centigrade to turn it to ink. And in a, less than a human hair, so this is 25 microns, extrude the exact color combination in order to then let that drop at the precise timing and hit a hot plate and let physics take place to harden and then do that at 325 millimeters per second. So we'd never done this before, but we thought, well, that'd be great. Let's go and print live on TV with a prototype and see if this won't go wrong. And um, so Mike flies out. I'm already in the States. He, he, I put him in a hotel. He's got the printer. He's got a backup printer, which is great. And he um, had to print one thing. We decided to give a Fox key ring to them. And so we thought, this is great. He couldn't get done, but what he did was he printed and then lost a flute. A flute that you play with. Right. First of all, I thought, well, that would be a better thing to give him uh, than, than a fox key ring. Yeah. But it suspiciously went missing. I said, well, print, print it again. It's done in stages, like a rocket, because of the size of the build plate. He goes, yeah, that's the problem. I said, something's wrong. It's just not working. Now, Mike was very calm. And, and, and he didn't have to deal with the front end, but he had to deal with the reaction of me because I'm feeling the pressure of everyone. I said, what do you mean it's not working? I said, how long do you need? He goes, well, hopefully not long. An hour goes by, two hours go by. We're on the next day, late into the evening. I said, listen, I said, oh, take some rest. If you believe you'll get it done, I said, check the power pack, go through all the, all, 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 all the, 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 uh, the, the checklist that he's got. I come in in the morning. And now we're down to an hour before we leave. He says, it's not working. And, you know, I melted. <laughs> and I just thought, I can't tell Fox News that we're not coming on live. And I said, what are we going to do? He goes, I don't know. I said, oh, God. So what proceeded was something that felt like Johnny Depp and the, the hotel room <laughs> as we both melted. <laughs> just, <laughs> And I don't think he forgave me. I mean, he, he, of course, we love each other, but I don't think he forgave me. It was just, the pressure was so bad. That and, is and, and I said, what about the other printer? Yeah. Yeah, same problem. I said, oh, God, how can it be the same problem? I said, what have we done? Is it the firmware? We got the wrong one. Why don't we have a backup? I said, is it the power pack? Are we using the wrong volts? 
He goes, I don't think it's that simple. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, everything's coming out green and blue. I said, oh, that's because we were moving so fast and our rendering software was not complete. And yet we wanted to jump the shark, so to speak, and get on and do it. Anyway, we've resolved it without giving away the book. He rode the wave of enthusiasm for the 3D printer. He garnered a lot of publicity around the world. So he had this front page fame as well as fortune. But was that like part of the master plan? Did you envisage with was that? You know, did you have to sort of put your face on the printer, so to speak? Well, we knew that, the, that if Mike and I, I, we said to each other, on the first night when we got out of the hot tub, I mean, it sounds very romantic, but <laughs> we like smoking cigars and we like being in the hot tub and we would talk about stuff. And we got out and said, are we really going to do this? And, 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 and that was it. We were on the jet. We were starting to make up stuff that we needed in the printer that we thought weren't there. And, you know, we knew that the minute we said that we had this hyper advanced printer that was, if there is a definition of the word revolutionary within an industry, this was it. This was the promise of the next PC. You know, we broke almost every record in consumer 3D printing. And we said, as a result of that, we're going to have a lot of people after us. Competitors are going to poo-poo our product and say, this is no good. Uh, we're going to have journalists say, we'll prove it. And if we come out with a, a deadline or a pre-order, just like Tesla, people say, where the hell are the printers? If you're late, they're going to crucify us. Um, we knew we were going to be out there. And we knew that all of the trade journalists would follow us. Um, and there's an old trick in, in how you tell your story. Um, if you're all in and you've got insane USPs and you've got a, a hype cycle or, a, a, or an accelerated industry trend, this is the hard bit. If you can pick that and then find the right problem to solve, now you've got to decide how to, how to tell and break your story to the industry. And so as a result of doing that, you can discover lots of protagonists that will get behind you and a ton of antagonists. And it's a bit like pawns in a single pawn game in chess. You hope you've got more at the end. Otherwise, if everything's equal, you're probably going to lose. But the trick is you can fuel that. You can tell that story. So we had to be front and center. To your point, everyone would know us. In fact, I said in one interview several years back, that I felt like the Eminem song, Almost Famous. We didn't want to be famous, but we would walk down the road and anyone that had heard about 3D printing had seen our faces, like it or not. They would have said, yeah, uh, we recognize you guys, or aren't you the guys that were on TV doing this? You know, that there are a lot of great characters in, in this book, and there's one character uh, in, in particular who intrigues me with the name Robert Storm. Yeah, I wonder if you want to tell us a little bit more about this guy. Why do you pick the only guy that I wouldn't want to talk about? <laughs> right, okay, that's I mean, why. Uh, you could have, I know, I can only guess. Um, <laughs> so Robert Storm was a character uh, that had to play multiple hats when the 15 strong people were already wearing too many hats. So it's common now, um, if you get hit with a bunch of emails, and you'll see these names, and it's, you know, Joe, John Gurr, you're like, who the hell is this guy, mm. right? And, and that person doesn't exist. He's just a face if, or a line on an email support, right? That, or a ticket that's got back to you because it makes it more personable. And, and they can identify with someone. So we thought, well, who is Robert Storm? Well, Robert Storm is the person that deals with all the crap that we can't deal with, all the customer support. And the person, my brother at the time, um, was running customer support. And at one point, with thousands of orders, you know, the, the phones were, were, were burning, people were chasing down product. The actual customer support follow-up bit, we had already written a bunch of, um, what do I want to call it, decision-based communication, which, by the way, has now become standard, right? You wouldn't do it any other way. So I wouldn't look at this as a bad thing. If you're not doing it, then you're probably spending money in the wrong place, right? So, so I'd go and do it. But Robert Storm, Storm was our early attempt at that. And boy, did he get some great questions. And he, he gave some very well orchestrated planned answers. They didn't always address what the customer wanted. And we found that out by learning the hard way. Um, and we fixed it. You know, we went through in 17 months or 
15 months we were getting bought. In the first year, we probably went through three support iterations of the model, working every hour, God sends, to try and make Robert Storm's life better. So Bot Objects, Bot Objects is your 3D printing company. Uh, it's a marvelous story. Um, was that a sort of weird and wonderful one-off, really? Or, you know, is there a kind of formula uh, to what you created at Bot Objects that you can, you know, derive from your experience? It's not about a formula as such, as opposed to modules. So I'll give you, my, I'll give you the humble story of um, Bot Objects as, as kind of an accelerated philosophy at that top level. So the first thing, you need to have insane USPs. And you have to have this hot industry trend. And if you've solved a meaningful problem and built a solution with the background of a hot industry trend and insane USPs, most of the work is done. So first of all, you have to know to look for that. Because without that combination, you can accelerate fast. It's just not possible. The other one I mentioned earlier is Decide how you're going to tell your story and, 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 and how you're going to break it to the market. Lots of tricks, protagonist, antagonist. If you've got that hype cycle, you can release a story to the market. And it's a little bit like The Last Samurai. Let them battle it out. right? Let the protagonist and antagonist say, this is great. I really want it. And then the competitors and cynical journalists, not yourself, but... Some guys like you, but you know, that, that, that will pull it down, and, and, and all of a sudden you're looking at it. And if you find the antagonists are winning, you drop another video into the market, you fuel it a bit more. We didn't spend a dollar on PR or marketing, that's how hot the idea was. So, there's a lot of tricks in doing that. The, the, you know, the, the third one is accelerate fast, super fast, make sure. That you don't say to yourself, well, I've got X amount of money, I'm just going to, um, you know, let's see what we can get done. Or you're, you're doomed to failure in an accelerated model of high risk. What you've got to do is say what should be done and then go convince other people of how you're going to get them on board or what money you're going to use. And I think I mentioned another one, all in means all in. You have to live and breathe it. You have to be the greatest advocate of your business. Um, you have to go out there and be uh, take a leadership position and go and, 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 and go and take battle with everyone. A great example, although I don't agree with everything he does, is Elon Musk. Is he does this um, fairly well in terms of his intent. We just don't always like what comes out, but we like his intent, and that's that he is willing to put himself front and center and debate what's going on. And if you're going to be in an industry that's going to present some really big opportunity, that's not an algorithm, but a formula. I noticed reading the book, uh, a lot of movie references. And I know you've always been a cinephile. And uh, indeed, I think you thought of going to acting. I know you've written a, a, a film script. And I hear rumors of a potential movie based on this book. So I want to ask you, you've got Scorsese lined up to direct, or Spielberg? Well, you say it tongue in cheek, I can tell. <laughs> I can just have a sense of oh, that. Someone I can, else, I can know, feel it. Someone else. <laughs> oh, um, Would Brad Pitt possibly play you or I think, George Clooney? I think I think they're getting uh, they're getting too old. Um, I think <laughs> as I as am I. Um, I so so I my um, so I started acting. I loved film. I've been in film longer than I can remember. I did say quite erroneously to a couple of people that if the book became a bestseller, it's so character rich that it's perfect for the screen. So we'll see, um, but there's a good chance. I wonder who's gonna play the part of Robert Storm. That's gonna be a tricky one to film this now, actually. But anyway. Um, AI. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. A okay. hologram. Yeah. Uh, so what ideally would you like the reader to take away from, from this book? I think when everyone writes a book, you want to make sure that people are moved by the subject. Um, if they don't feel anything, then you've probably failed at writing something. If they don't finish it, you've failed at writing something. Um, so that's the first thing, to be moved by it. 
And the second thing is really simple, to take action, right? to be inspired by the book. You know, this is a roller coaster book, and, and, and perhaps why it's suited to the screen. Not everyone needs to go and take that journey. There are plenty of forms of entrepreneurship, but I think it's, it's loaded with insights to give people confidence and encourage people to, to try entrepreneurship or to perhaps unpick a problem or to go and find a mentor or help. Uh, and not just my program, a program that perhaps you, you like or have been referred to, um, to you know, move people to take action. I picked up my copy of the book in the States. Um, when is the book available over here in Europe? The UK launches the 1st of February, um, and then Europe is shortly after. Well, look, Martin, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I don't want to monopolize you. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the point at which uh, I'm going to throw it open to the floor okay. and invite questions here. Martin, um, what special skills, in your opinion, um, do you need to uh, achieve your level of success? Um, I think, and I don't want to repeat myself, but but I would say that um, go, go and get help and understand the pitfalls of entrepreneurship. It sounds like a simple thing. And kids today, um, they're so talented, they're so smart, they're so aware because of technology that they think they can toss the rule book out the window. But guess what? <laughs> the underpinnings of selling, the underpinnings of marketing, the underpinnings of building a product haven't changed. And so someone out there has learned the hard way. And so those pitfalls are far better to swallow your pride and learn from someone. And you can do that through coaching and mentoring and really believe that, that that 10, 20, 50 hours, even if you do that asynchronously with becoming an entrepreneur, is invaluable. So, so I would argue I am still learning today and I would be considered in this area my greatest work, right? I, I live for entrepreneurship, I study it. I was obsessed with converting it to a science. I failed at that because it's human. But I will tell you um, that it's not just about ideas. It's not just about execution. It's about looking around corners and knowing what to anticipate. This will make you a far better entrepreneur. And I had three great mentors while you know, ferociously studying the subject of entrepreneurship. Um, another thing is that you have to try. You know, don't talk about it, you have to go and do it. It's better to thrust yourself in and create some kind of mental capacity for doing it. Because most people will be in a job like me, an entrepreneur, and become an entrepreneur, uh, rather than just go into it straight from school, which may be a little too early. Um, there's a lot to learn. But other kids will learn from failure. And because what's the best time to fail when we don't have responsibilities, when we're young? We get up and say, well, you know, I'm still living at home, right? Or I paid the rent for, for 12 months. I can afford to take a risk. I would still argue they will learn more by, by finding mentors, by surrounding yourself with people that can make you better. And then the other one uh, I would say is uh, curiosity and proving you know, problem solving, really good problem solving is something you can teach yourself. Um, and I started out a big picture person, I became immensely detailed. I like to think I'm somewhere in the middle now. I don't know. But I like solving problems. And I don't stop until I really feel like I, I understand it. A, a, a guy who did an op-ed recently, Tim Cook of, of Apple, the CEO, uh, you know, talked about the fact that he'll continue having meetings until he thoroughly understands the issue at hand. And that takes a a measured approach to entrepreneurship. Uh, if you can have those kind of skills, and then you still need the eureka, you still need the product, you still got to find the underlying, you know, pair the problem back and build something. You still got to do the methodic piece, or you know, the methodic piece, I should say, like understanding surface area or total addressable market. 
You've got to understand how your USP is, who your customer is, where you're going to find them, what are their needs. All this stuff's got to happen. But those skills that I talk about are far more elusive. And if you get them, you're likely to have a greater chance of success as an entrepreneur and be, I guess, somewhat like me, because I like to think that I went that route. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, is there, what is the one thing you would change or do differently about your startup story with Hot Objects? I, I, wish, I wish that uh, Mike and I hadn't broken down a few times. Um, I wish we hadn't um, you know, been screaming in a room for a long time. Um, some of those times were way too stressful. When we finally did the deal, Mike said, let's not do this again. And then he found himself in the next startup of mine. <laughs> we carried on. <laughs> he, yeah, he, was in the, he was in the early days of my streaming business. Um, no, I, I, I think there's, there's always... By the way, reflection is a brilliant thing, right? Reflect, reflecting does not tell you... Uh, it doesn't give you certainty on the future because it's always changing. But what it does do is say, remind yourself of what those low lights are. You know, what would you change? And... Um, we bit off more than we could chew. And we were young and fit and, and you know, wanted to do it. And um, we had so much fun. Like, I'm so glad I went through it. Um, but I don't think that that's the recipe to go and make 50, 100 million. I mean, yes, it's if you want a great riveting challenge, then see me afterwards and let me tell you what that methodology is because you can go and do it. But you will have the world on your shoulders, especially if you go into AI and claim that you've got the next robot, right, that literally can do your job completely. At the moment, they can't, right? So, but if you could say that you've got an, a, a robot that is as equally as good at English as it is at math, then we all should be quite worried, right? So, so I would argue that we went out and did that for our industry. Um, I, I've done it. The things I do now have just as much runway, plenty of risk, plenty of crocodiles in the river, um, but it's still easier than, than, than bot objects. So the pace is what I'm probably getting at. And also, um, you know, some decisions you wish you did better. I used to say to Mike, Jesus, we missed another product. You know, and all of a sudden they won't say, oh my, look, they're never gonna bring this out. What did that mean? Three more communications to the press. So this happened all the time. And then we would get another magazine that would, would critique it based on the fact that we hadn't shown enough evidence of what we've done. I mean, boy, did we put ourselves out there. I think I could be a little more articulate about that next time. Hey, Martin. Um, let me start off by saying great Q&A session. Very interesting. Thank you. Now, you talk about entrepreneur seminar and the importance of mentoring. If I were to join, do I get mentored by you directly, or how does it work? So the course is, I think I mentioned, 20, 22 and a half years old. Um, we have a database um, of everything I've written. Uh, I don't know what it's at now, 13 or 1400 uh, questions. Uh, there is a rule in the organization that no response can be given to a candidate that, that uh, I have not already answered exactly, or I write another one. And then I mentor um, twice a month normally, unless I'm traveling. Um, and we've waited for all this as we up, re, uh, reinvent parts of the program again, things that we continually improve. So I'm constantly active with the program. Um, yes, we could have other people uh, teaching. Um, I prefer um, that it's, it has, a, again, a sufficiency, a level of detail. Um, and if you look at anything compared to other people that, when they talk about entrepreneurship, um, I think I get better results. I prefer to, to be doing that. And I get an awful lot of fun out of it. I, I absolutely love it. I'm constantly looking for further ways to engage with the team. Hence, when I look around the room, I can see people on the program uh, because I connect with them. Um, and I, I just love the process. So the answer is yes. Hi, Martin. It's me again. Um, <laughs> just wanted to ask, um, so if you didn't have the initial seed capital, what would you have done differently? If, if I didn't have seed? If you didn't have the initial seed capital to oh. the one million, what would you have yeah. done differently? Um, well, I'd raise the seed. I'd, I'd raise the seed to capital if I needed to. I was at a point where um, you know, Mike and I had had some success 
Now, wouldn't, you know, we were no Elon Musk, um, but we understood entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and we had the capital. Um, sometimes it's harder. A lot of, I see a lot of cheap entrepreneurs who just go and raise the money and dilute. It makes me believe that they actually don't believe in their, their business. Uh, but I would, you know, I used to be a VC or a venture capitalist. I would raise the money. Um, uh, it's not difficult if you know what to do. And again, that is a science. That is, is a, if I look at the verticals of entrepreneurship, raising money is as close to a science as you will get. And that I teach uh, as part of the program. And so uh, you're having sat on both sides uh, and also raise a, 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 you know, a ton of money in different ventures. Um, the seed capital, you got to be, you, again, there are some pitfalls. You've got to know uh, the dilution ratios. You've got to know uh, what's a, a, an acceptable amount. You've got to know what your valuation is going in and that you can defend it. You've got to be a credible character. Um, when you ask money, you've got to know everything about them. There's the five rules um, so that you don't look ignorant and, and you can understand and give them the acceptance that you've been thorough because you're the advocate. And I could go on. I won't give you all of it and, and raise through it, but I'd raise the money. Hello, Martin. Hi. It's been a great evening. I came all the way from Norwich to be here, and I'm glad I came. And Thank you. Just to Habiba for inviting me. Um, so I run my business on my own, mostly with a little bit of help from family. And I just wished I would have another replicator of me to do the marketing side. So I'm a scientist, and I do the science bit of the things. And uh, like you mentioned a lot about how your relationship with Mike helped a lot to propel your business. So how can people like me? find somebody who could be at this stage of my business more like a sweat equity person and, and we could work together complement uh, supplementarily on the tasks that I can't do yeah the marketing yeah you know. so, so three three quick things right first of all um, find what the symptoms are uh, that you're experiencing write them down be very clear about what what you feel you're sure on and get us get get to as much detail as possible the second thing is, Reverse that and say to yourself, what make back to my complete leader point? What, what are you completing and what do you really need? And the reason why I get at is you should be able to address the symptoms and get more from any hire that you bring in on, on any terms or, or contract. So with, we, we need to, with Mike and I, it was, I was going to see you, was going to be the CTO and uh, he was going to be chief of product and I would be doing pretty much everything else. And this balance was, was, was good for me. I, therefore, everything I saw in the product, product management, product marketing, uh, product engineering, I could put to him. You might have more than one person that you need. And um, yeah, I don't know what your, 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 and you can certainly share it with me, but I don't know what your um, structure is for your company or how you're set up. But this would, de this would depend on the third element, and that's what community do you place yourself in to address the needs that you've got? There are many ways to find people to engage. And there is this bridge, the bridge between your symptoms that you're experiencing and therefore what you think you need in terms of the functional characters, right, of which some of them in the beginning, if they're rounded, more mature, been through the process, may be able to wear multiple hats, as a lot of entrepreneurs have to do. The third element is the bridge, is what is it you say back with the vision to convince people to come and what are the terms in the contract that you would like to apply? Is it sweat equity that you really need? Is it some kind of partnership? Is part of the model you can outsource? I would argue it probably isn't. Like, but all of what you've got right now will be proprietary and needs to stay in. Very rare is it outsourcing. If you're outsourcing tasks in the beginning, it's a problem. But what you can do is make sure you've got your, your understanding of the role, understanding of the vision, understanding how you're going to sell it to encourage them, and a little bit about the contract side so that they can feel comfortable. And then there's, there's the community relations. There's many ways to find the right people. We can place ads. Uh, we can enter into discussion groups. We can attend conferences. Give yourself three to six months if you want to do the job properly in finding people. And we have a methodology for doing just that. Um. <clears throat> as our entrepreneur in the front row suggests, we all need a team. And uh, we've been privileged tonight to have your presence here. But I would like to ask you now to thank Martin Warner, Bobble, for taking the mic and giving us his insights. Thank you. Thank you.